in our last class, you'll remember that we looked at <clears throat> Daniel's description of the time of the end. And we said that there was an increase in speed, many running, uh, the world moving apace too fast. And they were going to run to and fro. There will be an increase in change. The world will become too fickle. And now we want to look at another aspect of the world in which we live as disciples. And it's the fact that nothing is settled. Everything is restless, shifting, constantly changing. The world is discontented. It wants change. It wants distractions and diversions. Always something new, running to and fro, to and fro. It's obsessed with change. It's disturbed. It's too fickle. It's a pretty uh, chief characteristic, isn't it, of our age that plagues us. Constant updates. Constant updates. Nothing stays the same. The only constant thing is that everything is always changing. And I know that despite nothing ever seeming to change with Combined Weekend, it's the same hot dogs on Saturday night and the same potatoes on Sunday lunch. I know that this affects us still. So, I want to talk about this tonight, our changing world. As we start, consider this. In 1800, the horse-drawn Royal Mail coach could go 18 kilometres an hour on good roads. On a good day, maybe 100 kilometres. And your precious letter would be in a locked compartment under the carriage and an armed guard and VIP passengers were inside and normal passengers like ourselves would cling doggedly to the roof. It would take about eight days for your letter to travel from one end of Britain to the other. There were less than one billion people alive. State-of-the-art medicine included leeches to bleed patients. And any kind of surgery was done without anaesthetic. The deadliest weapon of war was something called the bomb catch. It could fling an 80 kilogram shot with 15 kilograms of explosive, one and a half kilometers. I mean, that's serious technology. Now, in 2024, we routinely travel 50 times faster than the Royal Mail Coach. We can travel 40,000 kilometers in a single day, halfway around the world. Our emails and our texts arrive almost instantaneously anywhere in the world, and we can fling, we're told, a nuclear bomb as far away as Mars, and it can carry a billion times the explosive charge of those old bomb catches in 1800. By almost any measure, everything is changing exponentially at an unprecedented rate. Just look at the last 100 years in America. In 1900, there were 76 million Americans. None of them, by the way, in 1900, not a single one, had ever flown on an aeroplane. 100 years later, the population has gone up five times to over 300 million. In 100 years, divorces have gone up 100 times, from 200,000 a year to 20 million a year. Women in the workforce hasn't just doubled or tripled, it's gone up 50 times. Now, 75% of families have both parents working, probably, they would say, as a necessity to live. Highway fatalities have gone up 1,000%. In just a hundred years. And there's a pattern to the kind of change that's happening. Look at this. The time to double GDP. Gross domestic product. It's an economic measurement. In Great Britain, in the 19th century, it took 150 years for Britain to double GDP. In the 20th century in the United States, 
50 years. In China and India in the 21st century, to double GDP, 15 years. It's exponential. What is exponential? Well, this is what uh, Dr. Richard Svensson says in his book, uh, Margin. Because there is little in our day-to-day lives that changes exponentially, we tend to think with a linear mindset. The sun rises and the sun sets. Week after week, everything seems about the same. Meanwhile, largely unnoticed by us, history has shifted to fast forward. Exponential now best describes most of historical change. What is exponential? Well, it's a J-curve. It looks like this. It chugs along like nothing's happening. Then all of a sudden, there is this sharp vertical thrust. And you can graph almost everything happening in the world on this curve. Amount of junk mail, marriages breaking up, cell phone activity, species becoming extinct, computer processing power, it all fits on this graph. This is what's happening in our world, exponential change. And our intuition always looks backwards and we can't see it coming. We can't see it happening. We're living, brothers and sisters, not just in an age of unprecedented speed, but an age of unparalleled change. You try telling your kids that when you were growing up, you were... Your older brothers or sisters used to learn how to type on a typewriter. That you used to write letters to your friends and put them in the mail. Tell them there were only four television channels just 30, 40 years ago. And you had to go to the library to get books out to do your school projects. I mean, put your hand up if you remember using a microfiche. Yeah? Some people can remember a microfiche. We would laugh, but I asked my kids, do you know what a microfiche is? They got absolutely no idea. The world has dramatically changed. It's a totally different world than just 20 or 30 years ago. The iPhone was launched in 2007. Seven years later, it had 1.3 million apps. Today, 9 million. It's exponential change. It's unbelievable. No wonder our older brothers and sisters particularly are looking perpetually shell-shocked and lost. They're bewildered. If you are in your 90s, you have seen more change in your lifetime than the rest of history combined. A hundred years ago, we were still driving horse and cart, right? Right? for the most part, in rural New Zealand. Horse and cart, 120 years ago. The world has dramatically changed on this J-curve. Now, just think what this means for our ecclesias. Have you ever wondered why the older brothers and sisters, let's say 60 years old and older, they just can't understand why the young people just want to change everything? Well, now we know why. Those brothers and sisters were born in the first two-thirds of last century, let's say before uh, 1970, before this vertical thrust of the exponential curve. Of course they feel like that. Of course they feel like that. But the young people were born right at the end of this curve as it's going upwards on the sharp vertical rise. Change is absolutely, totally normal. It's all I've ever known. In fact, if it's not rapidly changing, it's boring. So we have brothers and sisters in our lifetime, in our ecclesias, sitting right here in this hall, who have lived in vastly different universes from each other. And we need to be sympathetic. This is a very unique generation that we live in, the time of the end. And our older brothers and sisters need to realize that maybe the young people are not all totally rebellious. They just live in an age where this is normal for them. They're going to need our sympathy, our life experience. It's all they've ever known. And our young people need to realize that for 6,000 years, this type of change, this rapidly changing world that they think is normal, has never existed before. And it might not be all that helpful. They need to realize that 
Not all of their ideas might be wise, and maybe some of the old ways might be best. The wisdom of the older brothers and sisters might be worth listening to. These are challenging times for all of us, especially in the household of faith. We are living in an epidemic, brothers and sisters and young people, of rapid change. Everyone's stressed and exhausted. The world is galloping into the changing mists of the future, and they have no idea what lies ahead. Do you know they say in the next 20 years, we will experience another 100 years of change. The last 100 years that seen more change than the rest of the history of the world, we'll see in the next 20 years. Well, maybe that might happen if Christ doesn't come. And then they tell us that in the next 100 years, we will see 20,000 years of change. And we just know that ain't going to happen, is it? That is not going to happen. Our Lord has to come. Something, somebody has to step into this crazy world of exponential change and alter it, change it. You know, in a sense, we don't even need the signs of the times, do we, when we look at this exponential curve. Russia, the Pope, the Middle East, Europe, all of these, we know the world is heading towards its own self-destruction. Too much change. It can't continue. And this is not just us saying this. Look at this writer way back in 1958. The ever-accelerating progress of technology and changes in the mode of human life give the appearance of approaching some essential singularity in the history of the race beyond which human affairs as we know them could not continue. It just can't go on. It can't go on. Christ will have to come. We know he will. But while we wait for his coming, what about our lives of discipleship in these times, in the time of the end. A world, a culture, a society so immersed in constant accelerating change that's toxic to the truth. What of us? You just think, brothers and sisters, of our Heavenly Father. In all of this time, he has been absolutely unchanged. In 6,000 years, and to be fair, a lot longer than that. 100% the same. We know these references well. I am Yahweh, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. And his son takes after him, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. We can deceive ourselves, can't we, into thinking, like the churches, that because everything's changing, God has to change. But God's never going to change. The churches are busy changing everything. We have to evolve, they say, to keep up with changing times. They're flat out changing the Bible, its translations, God's view on men and women's roles, sexuality, morality, what he really meant when he gave the simple record of creation in Genesis. Everything's up for change. But we know God doesn't change. The truth is unalterable. It's 100% fixed. There are no updates necessary. But these are dangerous times for us. The world's changing faster than it ever has in human history. And we are subtly, or not so subtly, being pressed into the mold of an ever-changing and volatile and unstable world. The world's trying to make us abandon our Heavenly Father and His Son, who change not. So what does what do the Scriptures have to say about these things. Well, as we think about this subject, I I just want to look at one man and his three friends. It's actually the man who wrote Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. Four men who were put under immense pressure to change, to change everything about themselves to be more like the world. And I'd like you to come back to 2nd of Kings 24 as we begin this evening. 2nd of Kings 24 is the start of the story of Daniel and his three friends. Second of Kings 24, and we read in verse 10. At that time the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. 
And we read in verse 14 that he carried away all Jerusalem and all the princes and all the mighty men of valor, even 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and smiths. None remained save the poorest sort of the people of the land. And he carried away Jehoiachin to Babylon and the king's mother and the king's wives and his officers and the mighty of the land. Those carried he into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon. And all the men of might, even 7,000, and craftsmen and smiths a thousand, all that were strong and apt for war, even them, the king of Babylon, brought captive to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar had swept down into Judah, and he carried away the cream. It was God's punishment for, well, for what? Disobedience? Yes. But look what the prophets have to say. Proverbs says, My son, fear thou Yahweh and the king, and meddle not with them that are given to change. And what was going to happen was the people of God were going to start meddling with God's ways. They were going to start changing things. Isaiah 24, they've transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Jeremiah 2 says, My people have changed thee glory for that which doth not profit. Why gaddest thou about so much to change thy way? The nation of Israel were trying to change everything. Lamentations 4, how is the most fine gold changed? The fine gold represented the precious sons of Zion. People were changing. She hath changed my judgments, Ezekiel 5 verse 6, into wickedness more than the nations. And all the prophets were going to testify of God's frustration. People were trying to change the truth. And God was going to sweep them away to teach them a lesson. It was time to divide the good figs from the bad figs, to start again with a remnant. His people wanted to change? Well, God would bring change. Nebuchadnezzar, and he would reveal their hearts. And now we read in 2 Kings 24, verse 17, these words. And the king of Babylon made Mataniah, his father's brother, king in his stead, and changed his name to Zedekiah. And we ask the question, why? Why bother? Why bother changing his name? Now, you know that Pharaoh Necho had done exactly the same thing in the previous chapter to Eliakim. If you just are there in chapter 23 in verse 34, you're going to read that Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim the son of Josiah king in the room of Josiah his father and turned his name to Jehoiakim and took Jehoahaz away. He changed his name. It's an old idea. Pharaoh did the same to Joseph, you remember, way back in Genesis 41, verse 45. He called him Zaphnath Paneer. It's a clear, unashamed attempt to integrate someone into Babylonian or Egyptian society. After all, our name is able to express quite a lot about who we are. It's a massive part of our identity. And the world, brothers and sisters, and young people, is out to change our identity. Unashamedly. Now, amongst the cream of conquered Judah that got dragged into captivity were Daniel and his three friends. And their story starts in Daniel chapter 1. So come with me to Daniel chapter 1 and a couple of verses, verses 6 and 7. The king of Babylon tried to change everything about these young men's lives. Now, among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel... Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. It was three years, verse 5, of brainwashing, blatant and calculated indoctrination into Babylonian ways. Everything was changed. They were removed from their homeland. All the familiar places of worship, gone. 
They were removed from their parents, from their family, from parental counsel, wisdom. They were removed from the Hebrew language, verse 4. They had to learn an unfamiliar tongue. No learning Torah. They were taught science and maths and astronomy, the wisdom of this world. In the finest Chaldean universities, their music, their books, their language, their clothes, even their food, everything was changed. Every trace of Jewishness, every trace of God, every trace of the truth systematically removed. This was a true challenge to discipleship, wasn't it? A world upside down for these young people. So much change. And not only random change, but change deliberately intended to eradicate the truth. What a test. Would God be forgotten? Would God be abandoned? Maybe prioritized into the background? Would we still do our Bible readings, brothers and sisters and young people? Would we still pray three times a day towards Jerusalem? Or would we just forget about God? I mean, it sounds like, seems like he's forgotten about us. Well, there was only one thing that was going to withstand this kind of intense pressure, and it's there in verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. He made resolutions. This was their roadmap to success, and we're going to find that there is nothing stronger than a purposed heart, a determined, steely, gritty determination to not change. Because for these young men, change was not just change, was it? The king's meat meant defilement. He purposed in his heart. Look at these words. This is our heavenly father. This is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth. For Yahweh of armies hath purposed, who shall disannul it? When God decides, he doesn't change. He purposes it in his heart. Jeremiah 4, I have purposed it and will not repent, neither will I turn back from it. 2 Corinthians 1, Paul says, Do I purpose according to the flesh, that with me there should be yea, yea, and nay, nay? There's not yes and no with me. There's only yea in Christ Jesus. This is the lesson of purposing in our heart. It's a determination to not repent or waver or falter. To have a religious conscience that stands against the world's attempts to change us. And this was how Daniel and his three friends were able to not change in 70 years. And in verse 11 of Daniel chapter 1, They are three years in, three years of Nebuchadnezzar and his attempted assimilation. And look what it says in verse 11. They're still men of God, aren't they? Judgment of God. God is gracious. Who is like God and helped of God? These men aren't changing. They've purposed in their heart. And in verse 19, it is these unchanged, unconformed men that stood before the king This is a parable of our lives. We're all hoping to escape those things that shall come to pass upon the earth and to stand before the Son of Man, as as our Lord says in Luke 21. They're a prototype of what we want to be. Living in Babylon, yes, but unchanged by Babylon. And in verse 21, Daniel at least stood before the king, we're told, till the Persians had toppled Babylon's world empire. The kingdom of men has disappeared in type, passed on, been replaced. And Daniel is still there. It's like he's immortal, still standing before the king because he's different, because he stood apart. He purposed in his heart never to be changed by a system that's destined itself to be replaced, to be changed. He was trying to be the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, we know the story of Daniel and his three friends well. And I just want to highlight the two biggest moments of testing that we read of in Daniel's story about these four men. Would they change? 
Would they buckle under Nebuchadnezzar's pressure? And the first story we want to look at, just very briefly, is the story of the fiery furnace in Daniel chapter 3. The challenge to Daniel's three friends was very clear. We read this in Daniel 3 verses 5 to 6. The herald said, That at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, sultry, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, fall down, worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up, and whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. The message was very, very, very simple. Abundantly clear. Conform to Nebuchadnezzar's rules or death. Nebuchadnezzar had just had a very disturbing dream in Daniel chapter 2 of an image. An image with different metals. It was destroyed by a stone rolling off a mountain. And his response couldn't be clearer, could it? The image was all of gold, in defiance of God's interpretation, set up on a pedestal in the middle of a plain. No mountains or rolling stones or boulders to be seen. This is a defiant bid for immortality. And you know, you can't read Daniel chapter 3 without reading over and over and over again that this was the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. You might like to color it in. It's there in verse 1. It's there in verse 2. It's there twice in verse 3. It's there in verse 5. It's there in verse 7. It's there verse 12, 14, And 18, nine times in this chapter, Nebuchadnezzar set up the image. Why the emphasis? Well, we just need to read back in chapter 2 these words. Verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up. A kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. You see what Nebuchadnezzar's doing? This was Nebuchadnezzar pitting the kingdom of men against the kingdom of God. And Nebuchadnezzar was saying, forget, abandon your God, your worship, and conform to mine the image that I have set up or else. Well, look what these remarkable young men who had purposed in their hearts not to change said. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Literally, when we, we read in verse 16, uh, we read, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Literally, it means we have no need. We don't need a second chance. Our minds are made up. Let's not forget, brothers and sisters, that they had already been delivered from Nebuchadnezzar, hadn't they, in chapter 2 and verse 13, when he was going to kill all the wise men. How could they change? How could they worship Babylonian gods that had been unable to save them in Daniel chapter 2? It had been the God of Israel that had saved the lives of all the Babylonian wise men, not the Babylonian gods that had saved the Jewish wise men. These men were unchanged, unwavering, steadfast in their faith. They understood the principle of the burning bush that was not consumed. You know this reference, but just come back to Isaiah 43 in verses 1 and 2. This was the promise of God to his people in difficult times, in trials. 
Isaiah 43, verses 1 and 2. But now thus saith Yahweh that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. We're not going to change our names, say these men. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Reminds us a little of our first session, doesn't it? Passing through the Red Sea, through the waters, passing through the Jordan, through the rivers. And God had promised protection from the fire as well as the water. And so the question back in Daniel chapter 3 really was, has God changed? Has God changed? Will he be faithful to his promise if these three men were faithful to theirs? He is able to deliver us. But if not, we are not changing one whit. These are incredible words. Incredible words of faith. And do you know, if someone was going to be changed in this situation, do you know, it turned out to be Nebuchadnezzar. Because look what we read back in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 19. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury. If he was angry before, now he is red hot. And the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Here was a test of discipleship. A furnace heated seven times hotter. Who was going to melt Who was going to change, the three friends or Nebuchadnezzar? Well, we know the story, but look what we're told in verses 26 to 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace. He spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire, and the princes, governors, and captains of the king's counselors, being gathered together, saw these men, upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was an hair of their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word, and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. These men were absolutely unchanged. Not a hair was altered. That's Luke 21, verse 16. There shall not an hair of your head perish. Their coats, exactly the same, not touched by the fire, completely uncontaminated by the Babylonian fire god. I am Yahweh. I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Malachi 3 verse 6. Their faith had quenched the violence of fire, as it says in Hebrews 11. They were as unchanged, weren't they, brothers and sisters, as their heavenly father. And the Heavenly Father had sent his angel to go with them through the fire together. But look at who was changed. Nebuchadnezzar. They changed the king's word. And he's going to decree in verse 29 that now everyone needs to worship Yahweh or else. Death. Nebuchadnezzar is going to do a complete turnaround in this chapter. And here's the lesson. If we purpose in our hearts, brothers and sisters and young people, rather than the world changing us, we can change the world. 
Nebuchadnezzar, completely turned around. Now, as an interesting aside, it says their coats were not changed. Where do we first read about coats in the scriptures? Why, it's Genesis 3, verse 21, coats of skins. It's a different word here in Daniel 3, because Daniel 3, of course, is written in Aramaic. But it comes, the idea comes straight out of Genesis 3, verse 21, doesn't it? It represents the covering of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if we have him on, our covering, our unchangeable coat, the fire cannot reach us. What a lesson, brothers and sisters, in this story. Quite different, of course, wasn't it, by way of contrast, to Leviticus 10. You remember the story of Nadab and Abihu. They offered strange fire, strange incense. They were ambitious and disobedient and rebellious. And Leviticus 10 verse 5 says, they were incinerated by the fire and carried out in their coats. And I get the feeling, I don't know if you do, as you read Leviticus 10, was that part of the drama of that day was that while the bodies of Nadab and Abihu were incinerated by God, burnt to a crisp, their priestly garments were absolutely untouched, unchanged. The covering of Christ will always be intact. The question is, are we in him? And here, these three friends, they were in Christ, weren't they? They had Christ as their covering, as their faith. And so they were going to be unchanged by Nebuchadnezzar's fire. They yielded their bodies, we're told in verse 28. We won't go go there, but Paul is going to pick that up in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. He's going to quote these three men as the preeminent example of not being conformed to this world. He says, present your bodies. It's the same word, uh, as yield your bodies, as a living sacrifice, these men would rather give their bodies to the burning flame as a living sacrifice than change or conform to this world. Amazing example. These men staying steadfast to God. Well, what about Daniel? His three friends had come through the fiery furnace with flying colors. What would Daniel do under this kind of pressure? Well, Daniel was going to be tested in exactly the same way, wasn't he, in Daniel chapter 6. And the story of the den of lions. The Babylonians are gone now, conquered by the Medes and Persians. And now we're going to read of Daniel's test. And incidentally, on the way to Daniel 6, on the night that Belshazzar... Uh, came and, and, and uh, or Belshazzar was slain rather, and Babylon fell in Daniel chapter 5. After 70 years of Babylonian assimilation, trying to change him into Belshazzar in Daniel chapter 5, verse 12, he's still Daniel. Did you notice that? This man is unchanged. And you can imagine Darius as he sends his troops. Into Babylon that night, he says, listen, you look out for that old, white-haired, long-bearded Jewish prophet, and if you see him, you save him. He's been the wisest man in the world for 70 years. We need him in our administration. And now, briefly, we come to Daniel chapter 6 and Daniel's test. Exactly the same as chapter 3. Except this time it's a lion's den. Will you change your God, your worship? The same penalty, death. And we're going to find that Daniel is going to be likewise unchanged. Remarkably, he's been retained as prime minister of the world in a second world empire. Partly, you might say, for continuity. He knew the mechanics of the administration of the Babylonian empire. But we know chiefly It was because of his reputation, his character. He was scrupulously honest, completely trustworthy and loyal, 
So conscientious and reliable, he could just slot into any administration because he was exactly the same. Whoever he served, he was unchanged. But envy was brewing, verse 4. They tried to find inconsistency by which they might discredit Daniel. They sent out spies to see if they could trap him. Just like they tried to to catch out our Lord Jesus Christ with spies in Luke 20, verse 20. Does he behave differently in different situations? Are there any accounting mistakes with the empire's finances? Does he have any any, uh, secret sins or habits? But it seems like Daniel was completely irreproachable, absolutely consistent. And so they passed a straw law to catch him out, verses 7 to 8. All the princes in the, of the kingdom, the governors, uh, and the presidents, the counselors, the captains, they've all consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree, sign the writing, that it be not changed, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. And so now, the test was going to come. And look how the decree is described. An unchangeable law. The world is trying to change us, brothers and sisters, and it puts itself forward as an alternative to God, unalterable. And so Daniel was forced to or faced with two seemingly immutable laws, and he had to choose. That of Darius and the unchangeable law of the Medes and Persians, or that of his heavenly father. And neither could be changed, apparently. Who would he serve? Well, we know Daniel. Look at verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, He went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Nothing changes for Daniel. This was not really belligerent rebellion to the new decree, was it? He was just doing what he always did. He's unchanged by the pressure of the world. 75,000 prayers and counting. He's trying to be the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, we know the story. Actually, in verse 11, his enemies are banking on his consistency, aren't they? They're they're banking on the fact he's not going to change. They show up, sure enough, he hasn't changed. That's how reliable Daniel was. And so he's dragged before the king, he's condemned, sealed inside the lion's den with the king's seal, verse 17, so that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. But who changes? Look at verse 18. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep fled from him. Darius is up all night, brothers and sisters and young people, doing exactly what the decree outlawed, praying to another god to deliver Daniel. That was completely forbidden in verse 7. But just like Nebuchadnezzar, Darius does a complete turnaround. Does what he outlawed right across the kingdom. And so the king, we find, is going to rush down to the den at first light. Verse 19. And the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, Is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? See how how even the king has to admit, as he describes Daniel, 
This is a description of Daniel that just goes along with his name. He serves God continually. Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lions' mouths. They have not heard, hurt me. For as much as before him, innocency was found in me. And also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. I love verse 21. I love verse 21. Up until now, Daniel in this chapter has been absolutely silent. He's not uttered one word in self-defense or explanation or complaint. His first words in this chapter are after he's been resurrected in type out of the den of lions. This is an incredible man. And I think that this was a massive inspiration for our Lord Jesus Christ, who went through this exact experience. Falsely accused, sealed in a tomb, raised to life. It was all going to happen to our Lord Jesus Christ. And when Matthew 27 and verse 14 says, He answered him never a word. This is a marvelous thought. I think Daniel's steadfastness, his unwavering, unflinching, unfaltering faith and trust in God in Daniel chapter 6. We're going to inspire our Lord in his darkest moments. Daniel's recorded as saying nothing until he's out of the den of lions. Do you know, this is interesting. In this chapter, three times Daniel is described as this Daniel. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes, verse 3. Verse 5, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel. Verse 28, so this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius. You're not going to guess who else is described as this somebody. Well, it's our Lord Jesus Christ. Three times in the Acts of the Apostles, this Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place. And lastly, chapter 17, that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. This extraordinary man, Daniel, was clearly a type of our master. And I think his steadfastness and unchangeability, despite the trials that came upon him, were an inspiration to our Lord Jesus Christ in his darkest moments. This Daniel became this Jesus. Now look what we're told at the end of the story. Daniel chapter 6, verse 25. Then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble in fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. And his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. God never changes. He's unchangeable. He's steadfast in every respect. And the question we have to answer for ourselves is, will we be the same? Will we be steadfast and immovable, unaltered by all of Babylon's shameless attempts to change us? Even in the difficult times of of the fiery furnace and the den, how do we learn from Daniel and his three friends to be like them, to be like God himself, steadfast forever? How do we stay the same for God in a world that's changing faster than it ever has before? Well, to conclude, I just want to take you to four passages just very quickly. Four secrets of being unchanged. Secrets, you might say, of staying steadfast. And the first one is 2 Corinthians and chapter 1. We'll go through these very quickly, but I think it's worth turning these up. They all have the word steadfast in them. This is how we stay unchanged for God. 
2 Corinthians 1, verses 7 to 10. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Paul shares a secret about steadfastness. Our hope was steadfast, he says, because although massive pressure was on us, so that we despaired even of life, we did not trust in ourselves. We trusted in God. You think of the three friends, bound and cast into the furnace, heated seven times hotter. Think of Daniel, cast amongst the lions. The first key is that they didn't put trust in themselves. It definitely isn't our strength that's going to keep us steadfast. Where is our trust and confidence in a changing world? It has to be, brothers and sisters and young people, in a God who stops the mouths of lions, raises the dead, who quenches the violence of the fire. We can only stay the same because he stays the same. Number two. Just back one page, 1st of Corinthians 15 and our reading, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Oh, it's true that we need to be changed, don't we? We all need to be changed. Verse 51 says, We shall all be changed, but we're going to be changed by God, not by the world. And God will only change us to be like him physically if we are like him mentally. So here's our second key to staying steadfast, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always abounding. Let's be at the ecclesia, brothers and sisters and young people. Let's be supporters. Let's be there to help, to clean, to organize, to be involved, abounding in the Lord's work. Because as we integrate ourselves by working amongst the ecclesias, we stay strong together. Or as it says in verse 15 of the next chapter, we addict ourselves to the ministry of the saints. We've got to always abound In the work of the Lord. That's a secret to staying steadfast and immovable. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. Let's just read verses 14 to 15. We want to stay steadfast. For we are made partakers of Christ if. We hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. A key to staying steadfast is to just do one day at a time. It's simple. We just have today. Let's be unchanged and unaltered and unaffected by the toing and froing of the world just for today. We don't have to try and do it for the rest of our lives all at once. Tomorrow we'll take care for the things of itself. Let's just concentrate on our steadfastness for today. And lastly, I'd like you to come to Psalm 78 as we conclude our thoughts this evening. We don't trust in ourselves. We abound in the Lord's work. We take just one day at a time. And look what Psalm 78 has to say is another key to staying steadfast. Verse 1 Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. 
I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of Yahweh and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. The last thing we can do to stay steadfast is to invest in the next generation. What a challenge. The last secret to staying unchanged is to teach the truth to our children, to pass the truth onto our children unchanged. That it's the same hope. It's the same doctrines. It's the same standards of godliness. It's the same excitement for the truth. It's the same passion for the kingdom that got handed down to us that we pass on to our children and they can pass on to theirs. Maybe we can even make it better than what got passed down to us. This is God's challenge to us, to disciples living at the time of the end, enduring huge amounts of change that we purpose in our hearts to be steadfast, immovable. We don't try to do it ourselves. We concentrate on just one day at a time. We teach our children a love for God's unchanging ways and we make sure that we are always abounding in the work of the Lord because we know, brothers and sisters and young people, we know that that goal of being steadfast and immovable, that labor is not in vain in the Lord.